Hello and welcome to everybody to the fourth edition of Taming AI. Today we have a very interesting topic and this is coding and AI. And for this we brought four international experts who are artists, creative coders and who link their everyday coding practice, so to say, with artificial intelligence. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Yannick Hofmann, and I'm the artistic lead of the Intelligent Museum project. Now I would like to pass the ball, so to say, and just throw it into the panel so that then you could briefly present yourself to our audience. And I throw it to you, Yasha. Thanks, Yannick. Uh, I'm Yasha Jain. I've been working at ZKM for a few years now, and I work here as the software developer, um, mostly doing interactive media, interactive installations, and uh, some of my practices also include using AI uh, in my programming. Stefan, you're on my right, so it goes to you. Thanks, Yasha. Yeah, I'm Stefan Schulz. I live in Montreal for the last 20 or so years or in Canada. I'm educated in media arts in Berlin and Halifax, Canada. I now am for the last, I think, 16 years the, working for Rafael Lozano Hammer in his studio here in Montreal. I'm the head of R&D. I use my media art skills to write software, develop electronics to make his ideas uh, come true. So there is like a lot of learning involved every single day. So these AI tools we're going to talk about are very helpful. They make my job in parts easier and more difficult. So I'm very curious to learn about how this affects everyone else. I pass the ball on to Luna, please. Hi, I'm Luna Nana. Um, I um, I'm a creative a coder and artist and yeah I, I work with interactive systems mostly in the media arts I've been working freelance in 12 years for a lot of studios um, in Europe and the, in the US um, and amongst also uh, for example Rafik Anadol studio where we worked on large-scale installations um, that use AI and yeah, recently um, I was working almost entirely only with AI, actually. And yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Yannick. Jules. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Lena. Um, it's uh, great to meet you all. My name is uh, Jules the Place, and I'm uh, um, I'm a musician and a programmer, um, and I mainly make web pages. But I also do music. I was uh, started working with, I guess, machine learning technologies and art, um, mainly between 2017 and 2021. But uh, yeah, now but now I don't need to use it for art anymore. I've gotten further into synthesizers. So anyway, thank you, Yannick. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So um, in the beginning, I think it's always very interesting to get to know a little bit more about what we're actually talking about when we are using the AI term in this particular setting. And with this particular setting, I mean this particular panel discussion. So I'm now um, asking if I now drive in my car going to a specific venue maybe to an event and i'm using my gps system in my car which uh, tells me basically where i have to go am i using artificial intelligence in this uh, particular moment of time is there anybody who would like uh, to answer this question to me i feel like if you're driving usually voice activation is enabled in cars because you can't type when you're driving so if you're asking for directions you're definitely using voice so you might be using voice detections, language detection, uh, speech to text over there. And then if you do get past it, and if you're already using AI without really thinking of what you're doing uh, when you ask for directions, and then when it is giving you a recommendation of where to go, what to do, 
it's constantly alive in a way that it is getting new information and responding to you intelligently about change your route or there is traffic here, take another route, this is slower, this is faster. So if you don't go by the current definition of AI, which you would usually think would be networks and only neural networks, then yes, definitely you're using it even without the voice command. But otherwise also, I think, yeah, there, should, there has to be some aspect of uh, AI involved in the recommendation system. I keep on thinking what I like about cars these days when I do rent one, I don't own one, is they, they have these beautiful stereo cameras and the, fan, the newer cars even have LiDAR built in. So I always look at cars as parts like that I hopefully could rip out if I could afford it and, and use them actually to, to do what they do, but within the gallery space. Like, like Auster, for example, now like has a LiDAR, 360 LiDAR scanners that, that, are, that, are, that have an aperture that are actually built in into the front of some cars. Even you see self-driving cars going around, they have these ugly little pucks on them. So this is what I think of how AI is being used in cars because they do people detection, they do street detection and avoidance, people avoidance. Yeah, those are the AI systems within a car that I find technically very interesting. Just a small side story to it. When I was in my master's, uh, we had an autonomous car driving lab in our office and we were trying to do animal detection at night and to make the data set for an autonomous driving car, me and two other research assistants would go out on our bikes with a thermal camera in our hand and create a data set while biking, imagining that it's a car. And then we would take all of this data set, which eventually did go into an autonomous car system to detect whether there's an animal or not. So it's a bit funny how it started with a very human physical input to something that was supposed to reduce our input for like another completely different system. Yeah, that's, that's funny and sad. I'm very curious, Luna earlier in the preamble mentioned um, her people detection. Uh, usage of AI. I'm very curious because that basically is, is what it does. I don't know what technology it uses, but I'm very curious to hear more about that. Yeah, that's a good point actually also about the data set because it was a, a project where we had to implement um, like a gesture tracking for a large exhibition space. So people would be um, able to stand in the middle of the space and be able to swipe through content and do different stuff. Um, and so I was very fresh into AI and was really keen taking this on. And at first I wanted to implement my complete own model. Um, for that, I also found a data set and Yasha, you just mentioned that is so funny with how these data sets are created because it was basically a people swiping data set I found online. And um, these researchers did some crowdsourcing. So when you were opening up the data set, you had like hundreds of thousands, very short videos of very lazy people laying in their bed with their laptops on their belly and swiping in front of their camera. So I tried to do something with that and it eventually didn't work so well because it's still actually super hard to make like a differentiation between like just swipe to the left you will detect that, but the system will get really lost because people have to put their hand back actually. And it's like these kind of simple issues arise. So what we did is like, um, I can share my screen. So uh, what we see is actually um, implementation of MediaPipe, which is based on an AI model. And it's actually super fascinating how it can make a very precise tracking of all the face points and the finger points and also multiple body skeletons. What we used then in the end, because um, that was actually much easier to work with and make some manual logic about triggering things with these data. Um, see, seeing how you use MediaPipe reminded me of one artwork that we recently did, an artwork called Embodied Light Beacons, for which we used uh, multiple robotic lights mounted onto a large tower. And that had to be animated by people standing behind the tower with some sort of digital puppetry. And 
so that these lights look like a like a stick figure puppet when people move around. You can kind of see in the bottom there is a person whose skeleton we somehow needed to detect. And because these lights can actually move in 3D space with having multiple degrees of freedom, uh, we had to figure out how do we do that. And MediaPipe was interesting because MediaPipe actually also has a 3D skeleton detection, but it still has the problem of occlusion. If you put your hand behind your head, these points are not known anymore. Right, because that information isn't there. So we solved it actually by using three cameras looking at the same person to impose post that two D point detection that we we meshed all three points together in order to get a three D representation of a person. And this was, yeah. So many of Raphael's artworks they come through me, but they actually are like through collaborations with other talented people. Like this one was Ling Dong Huan, who. Uh, used his skills and um, using actually this is uh, the Apple Vision network that was used, which is based on PostNet and not MediaPipe. So the, the whole people detection, this is why I mentioned earlier with the cars, is super interesting. Segmentation is is another one just to know that there is a person, not necessarily where the skeleton is. I think that is being used a lot more too in our field at least, like blob detection. Luna mentioned that earlier too. It's now being replaced with segmentation. Luna, you also now mentioned um, the diff you mentioned AI tracking um, as compared to no non AI tracking. Could you elaborate um, on this difference? Yes, of course. So um, in the past, like uh, especially in the 2010s, uh, I think the tracking was super important for a lot of interactive installations. And so like within the community, many people came up with different solutions and often you had like a complete different conditions and, and spaces and cameras. So each solution was very individual and often like these things were only about track tracking if there's something brighter than usual to see if something is happening and before the connect was uh, coming out it was really hard to actually work with skeleton data so people had other solutions like um measuring the amount of light in a in a total picture uh, or i had sometimes uh, implementations that were measuring activity of movement in a certain area of the tracking camera picture um, to kind of de derive some interaction from it. And nowadays, this is completely yeah, obsolete because you can use any kind of uh, consumer camera and hook it up with multiple instances of media pipe and run everything over networks to your application and uh, do very sophisticated tracking with low cost um, cameras. Yeah. And, and the difference, I guess, is that uh, there's a, a trained underlying AI model who, who, who would um, learn on a lot of poses and match the images to what it would mean as a 3D or 2D pose, basically. Yeah, the blob tracking has been a big part of Raphael's and, and also my career you have to find the right carpets that absorb infrared light, but then you don't, then you find people but you don't know if it's one or two people or if it's a large person or two small people together. And so there's a lot of like restrictions. Okay, so this is interesting that you um, have some overlaps and basically also share some uh, approaches, which basically leads me to the question of actual sharing. I mean, um, maybe you give me a hand sign who is uh, um, involved with the open source community directly, like not only harvesting, but also contributing. Okay, Stefan, um, Yasha, is this, this is a full uh, hand sign or? Uh... Not dedicatedly, but I wish I would do it more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Lu Lu Luna, how's it with you? Yeah, okay. And Stefan, you're hesitant or, uh, so sorry, uh, Jules, you're hesitant or? I feel like a lot of the code that I write winds up being like disposable in some way and not I don't know, you know, sometimes I like, I wonder what, like, you know, the commitment to open source involves like working on a library or something like that. You know, I feel like a lot, a lot of the things we write are especially, you know, like, you know, working with artists and sketching and stuff like that, it, it kind of comes and goes. Mm -hmm. I think Stefan would like to react to this. 
it, it's it's interesting to hear like I, like I think one person's garbage is another person's pile of gold I raise both hands because it's also kind of a hands up like I without open source I think my career would have been very different because I started with processing as a programming language that's what they but um, it was shown to us back at the UDK in Berlin. Then I moved to open frameworks and I'm still there. I now see the younger people in the studio. They come with all sorts of other tools and I'm still stuck in open frameworks. And a lot of it has been thanks to like the, the generous um, open source libraries that people like Kyle McDonald or Roy McDonald or like Caroline Record put out there, like allowed me to actually take these modules, modify them, make little examples because there were not necessarily good documentation or not really good examples out there, at least for my specific use case. And that's what I put out onto the onto GitHub then. Basically just the folders of little problems I solved for myself, which may might be useful for other people, the younger Stefans in the future. So I'm not shy and then I abandon them and I don't keep on fixing them, even though people complain in the issues because well, we are all way too busy to move on. We need to make a living. Yeah, but I, I appreciate people like Jules that, well, I'm only going to do something if I inter interpret this right. I'm only going to do it if I can dedicate the right amount of time and expertise to it. I feel like a lot of what I was doing when I was going through the AI stuff was trying to find graduate student research projects that somehow used one of these libraries that I didn't understand fully, and I didn't understand neural networks fully, but I needed something that I could do something with with audio or do something with, I don't know, do something with video and get some sort of results. I think with the AI stuff at the time, it did specifically mean like neural approaches. And I don't really know much about pose detection, but in face detection, there have been all these different things, all these different libraries over time. And uh, it's always a matter of like, not only what can work, but like, how do you how do you get someone else to be able to work with it? I think it's really interesting that you're talking about using this stuff in a, in a live interface. This is something that AI is really does well from a technical perspective, is translating between different domains that are mutually unintelligible, but like taking text and turning it into a picture or something like that, or taking this amorphous low resolution camera image and turning it into, you know, points that you can do something with. In that sense, I feel like, like artificial intelligence has existed for a long time, but we wouldn't necessarily call it that because we expect some sort of sci-fi thing that's autonomous and something that speaks to the imagination in engaging with AI in an artistic way with these with these different artists. It was always like, well, you want, like you might not understand something, but you want to be able to comment on it and talk about it. And you want to be able to get it into, you know, I don't know, get at the, get at the meat of it through using it and through the problems of, of using it. And, you know, not necessarily, I don't know, somewhere like, a lot of people are somewhere between a, like a, well, on the far side of a technical understanding of what, what neural networks are or something like that. And AI is sort of this totalizing concept that can fit into so many places. I felt like the real difficulty was in like getting, getting something together that like, that you could get into a feedback loop with, uh, in a way that you can when you're when you're drawing or something like that or painting. I mean, what is art, you know? How does it how do you bring it into art making? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting point, Jules, also because I feel that's the very basic fundamental shift that I can feel in the field of AI in the last 10 years or so, where it was so difficult to get involved in it when it was you were writing one layer of net neural network and then adding one more and then having a data set and it would train for three days, fail 14 times, and you would do this. I'm so happy to not have to do that anymore. And it's very interesting that now it's it's just a tool that you can start using without having to learn it anymore. And that I feel is so cool that you, if you keep going this way, yes, it will be disruptive in a lot of ways, but fundamentally it would be so, um, it would open up 
paradigms for a lot of people to use this amazing thing without putting in four years of university in it. I mean, that's a really good point. And it's definitely way more accessible than it was. Um, but I think we should also not, um, still um, see that in order to, to people to really use it um, in a interesting way, it still takes a lot of time to learn these things. Maybe we have a different AI school now, which is more prompt engineering and less neural network coding, you know. Yeah, I was um, doing a lot of experiments with generative AI, particularly stable diffusion and video. And the amount of trial and error is something I never had before in my life. Like also because you have these intense rendering times. Sometimes I have like weeks where I just try to reach some look and I have to iterate it and it runs the whole night and I have to compile the video or render the video in the morning and see if it worked and then it didn't work and I have to run the whole thing again with different settings. Also because you don't know what doesn't work, right? Because it doesn't come with a guidebook of if you put in this, this, this word, it will fail. Yeah. But if you don't put, it's so, it's such a uh, black box this way for even non-programmers to just find out what is if I put in a sentence that has the world uh, child in it there's a good chance mm -hmm. it might not render because it thinks it would be unsafe I know there are like streams of reddit threads now which are dedicated to sharing this knowledge which is oh don't do this you'll get this output or this is how you hack into the system and this whole like pretending to get your answer out of it while you sort of manipulate the AI, especially like chat GPT, I saw a lot of people try to get answers out of it by manipulating it, which would also be some sort of engineering, right? You're prompt engineering in a way mm -hmm. which you ask it to role play sort of that, you know, oh, you know, if you don't answer me, uh, I will be really depressed or I would, you know, it would hurt my feelings. And then it answers you. This was also a very cool trial and error method to figure out on how do you hack this uh, AI. I have been working a lot with these two things, um, ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion, to combine them um, for basically um, Stable Diffusion takes prompts to make images and you can use it for making videos also, which is super interesting for me because I hope to collaborate with someone on a really amazing um, video with amazing never seen AI generated graphics. So anyone here in the audience see me like contact me if you want to make a video. I can also show some of these experiments and then I'll make the jump also to ChatGPT because after doing manual prompt engineering it came to my mind that ChatGPT can also do that for me and I can maybe show shortly something that is very very interesting actually. Networks like ChatGPT and stuff like that are trained on large scrapes of data just from the general internet. And uh, in a lot of other technologies like facial recognition and things like that were only possible because of facial recognition data sets that were released to stimulate the, the development of this technology and then became benchmarks for how well it works. It's funny that we can just use something like chat GPT without, you know, and when we think about the sort of the 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 way that the the what you can do with it is limited by how you can how you can prompt it. And yet somehow within it, it contains everything else. Um I feel like that's for me the biggest difference in seeing with these like extremely large neural networks that sort of try to drink the ocean and absorb all like five billion images from the internet, as opposed to the much smaller networks that we were able to train on a 1080 Ti five years ago, and that we we all struggled and waited, uh, you know, overnight and wondering if the training was going to work, waiting for 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 audio to come out of it. Now that it you can just use something like this. When we were training those networks, like to do voice transformation or something like that, we actually had to make the data sets that we wanted because we wanted to get, in, in that case, we wanted to get Holly's voice out of something. We wanted to get some sort of singing AI 
and we didn't really know what that meant. And we we knew these more uh, traditional techniques that you might have used in the last 20 years if you wanted to generate something. But we needed to uh, make something that was that could specifically work with the software we found, make something that was aligned, that basically had as little noise in it as possible so that the training would be stable. I did a lot of work with sample RNN at the time, and it was a similar thing where we wanted it to understand not, not an extremely large amount of information, but to understand a small amount. And then how do you take a small amount of data and, and make it large? If you have something very specific that you want to find with a detection algorithm or something very specific that you want to make and you want to get it out of the neural network, essentially get endless amounts of it out of the neural network. Then how do you how do you navigate that? That term navigation I find interesting. Hopefully I'm not going too far off track, but Mario Klingemann, who works a lot with like yeah, style glands and, and stable diffusion, like he once was asked, hey, what are the prompts that get you to the to that part in the latent space that produces those images that are so eerie looking and and he said, well, I'm not going to give those away because that's almost like the directions on a map that lead you to my secret island. So the navigating the, those spaces, those neural networks, those latent spaces, like the prompting in that way, as we mentioned earlier, is, is like a recipe that can in itself be data in a way that, that lead you to a, a place that is only yours. I always like that idea of thinking of the multidimensional latent space like a, like a map where I can find a location that no one else has found yet because it's so immensely large. And words get you there, but only if you know the right ones. I really like these romantic ideas of working with this thing. The one I thought of recently was, it's like you have a piece of paper on, on the surface of a lake, and then you pick it up and the, the paper is stuck together in different places. And that was what it was like listening to these things. Like you had some sort of strange attractor kind of chaotic system that it might repeat, but not in not in a predictable way. To Stefan's point, that's a very interesting point about uh, having your own space in this large latent space. And one really uh, interesting activity that we were planning on doing is to have one generated output and figure out what set of words get you there. And how close is it that you can get to that output using your own skills as a English speaker person? If you can do it with like a bunch of things. You can use it for text or image generation or however. That's a very interesting activity, activity to see how people get to that same point. And often people are unable to get to exactly there, but more or less you can find your way to, if you know where you have to go, right? Like this, see a painting or any image, and you visually start describing, which was a lot of fun to figure out uh, how to get there. Yeah, there's a similar game, a uh, semantic, where you uh, you go through the wordnet embeddings, and you have you have some target word that you don't know, but it can tell you through the similarity within wordnet how how close you are, and it's devious. <laughs> like Luna earlier showed some some. Disney point clouds of images, or maybe I've seen them on your website, that kind of visualize that that the latent space in a like rapid in a 3D space. Like if you're trying to create images to so make it more interesting for all the viewers, maybe that's something nice to see again. Because may, maybe you didn't use Tisney in it, but it was really nice to see a, a point cloud of custom data sets creating visuals. This data visualization is basically uh, showing different um, AI sorted point clouds where each with the, the proximity to the points to each other are describing their similarity. Like uh, in days later, this what you mentioned, uh, Stefan, um, the, the, to display this like with the Instagram posts, basically like all of these are Instagram posts, we worked with Instagram data um, and we did like these different um, AI based pipelines to get a meaning out of it. 
and yeah that's where we ended up maybe i just showed it very briefly that's the prototype we came up with within that project and the scope of the project was much bigger we also did write some papers and uh, that's the art doc visualization project and you can also find it online we did, did a lot of documentation about it actually and yeah that's a good visualization of the latent space also like um you could do i guess do this with input data of any kind of um model that you train it's always it's always interesting seeing a lot of images in a point cloud like this because it always makes makes you ask what is outside of that structure and that's kind of what is in the you know i feel like that's what what's really what you imagine you know it's it's the the most imaginary thing this uninterpretable thing stephen wolfram uh published a thing about uh viewing like what you see outside of these places in, in latent space looking at them systematically and trying to understand them the latent space is the is almost like the the fluid that the shape is floating in and then you go out into from somewhere else the points the images and the spheres and stuff like that they're just points of stability but you could imagine sort of circulating around them like the unexplored parts of a map mm -hmm. and and then you discover them yourself I think this is where where art comes in right and this is like yes earlier when we did hear of AI right and I've heard about it quite early on but it was always these academics talking and I always like oh okay as artists I want to get my hands on this but it's like okay well do you have money to to hire one of our grad students and we're like we're artists no we don't earlier that we spoke about you could train your own AI and that was the scope of what AI was capable of doing at that point with your own uh, computational capacity but now that there are larger models with which you can add the most fine-tuned but they are already pre-trained on this huge corpus of a data set which you and I in our limited capacity will never be able to touch but that has set the benchmark of what suppose uh, image generation can do up here and even if I go to train my own data set it will be just not nearly good enough I don't know how to uh, convince myself to use the larger data sets or how do you use it in a way that does not continuously make you feel as if you're doing something wrong especially if you're engaging with an open source community I think that's a struggle many artists have I, th I think I'm more pragmatic with it like we use machine version cameras or access security cameras that I used at the border like uh, in very yeah bad ways but I think that's the responsibility of the artist then to just not just make some happy ha ha beautiful looking thing but to at least be able to talk about and add to the conversation like use those tools but try to to add to the conversation visually or even just in the text that goes with the art so that people see we are informed but to stay away from the use I always think that we, we cut ourselves down by saying oh this is this is too dangerous or this is, has been trained the media has bias or the data set is has a lot of bias in it well yeah, let's use it anyway but let's maybe echo that fact somehow in the artwork so I, I like to produce beautiful just beautiful images um and I'm I'm totally down for that and I I'm I'm very uncritical about using all kind of models uh, that are trained on copyrighted material with the intention for my side that I use it in a very experimental way that would lead somewhere where no artists have been uh, yet so that's why I can be optimistic about these things and approach them from this perspective and yes I do not encourage to steal artists work or anything like that uh, like how this has been the discourse um, but yeah it's pretty much there right now generative AI models like stable diffusion or open source people can modify them uh, and find you them fine-tune them I personally as a Ghibli studio 
Um, Fangirl was extremely amazed seeing someone releasing a Ghibli Studio specific stable diffusion model. And I did some work with it also. And yeah, I don't know if you want to see it. I can show it to you. Here you see like a comparison of uh, the input video that I used. Um, and then like two different settings here in this particular um, Python script that is used for that. You see in these images, like it can make super pretty images, but it's still so hard to work with them because on the one hand, like when you have it kind of like fitting the video, it will flicker a lot. And if it if it's consistent, it might end up drifting into some world that is also super interesting. I like the right thing, how the how this anime character dis dissolves and then try to survive in the corals and then get eaten from the corals and appear again as a little creature. Um, I love these experiments and what happens while like working with that. Yeah. And I've been also exploring some other styles that I also don't um, see so far uh, in represented very much, like to have these very slight hyper-realistic AI layers on videos that could add effects like, for example, rain in my case. Like these kind of experiments are very like rewarding for me personally to work myself through these little baby steps. What can we do with um, with these um, generative AI images? Combining like prompts that would reference 3D rendering methods uh, and plastic and latex materials and then adding it to a video. Um, yeah would end up in these experiments and i yeah personally just really love these pretty images <laughs> Stefan, like <laughs> what you said before this reminds me um memo atkin on on twitter had an interesting thread where he collected a lot of TikTok reaction videos of people putting on like a filter made you younger and was and another one was of people making themselves look more quote unquote beautiful and the moment when they and, and he called it like is this psychological warfare because people saw themselves younger or more beautiful and they had a hard time once they switched it off and all these videos ended with the way they actually look like and it often came with this like very sad look of like mm, okay so I, I'm not this person anymore or so and seeing your very hyper like bright colors and smooth skin images makes me wonder like I, I guess being a father of two daughters it makes me there, there is a, a a worry not also and like what what do those realities that we can dive into those layers or do to us to our psyche there was a some article about this where it was comparing the rise of the beauty industry and Instagram filters. They were trying to derive a correlation between both of these uh, phenomena, which personally I get it. Like, yeah. I I have a little anecdote. Like, um, I was keep posting these um super intense AI videos with my own video uh, input uh, on Instagram, and uh, after some times, friends keep coming to me and we're like wow I totally forgot how you look <laughs> like yeah. I had these totally unrealistic images in my head when when talking about you and like it's I think it's a very subtle thing yeah also for myself like um working with that I mean I decided personally not to work with stock footage or um like grabbing some uh some other reels from Instagram, how this is happening a lot right now. But personally, I my intention was to uh, work out some art styles that I could really offer in collaboration with other artists to make like a short movies or uh, use it in installations. 
and for that it's um for me personally like really good to work with my own reference where i can also like um influence what's actually on the screen and work with the lighting and learn all these things so it's like a process i, I guess yeah i think that's a really important point it's like it's it's really cool working with your own data because then you really understand like what's go what's going in and you have a lot of control over what's coming out and then tuning it is its own it's a, is its own unique problem um the voice transformation network that we used uh for for Holly was originally designed by someone who wanted to turn their voice into Hatsune Miku the Vocaloid and so they had recorded like an hour of Hatsune Miku and then they like recorded themselves saying all the phrases exactly so that they could transform themselves <laughs> and sing through Hatsune Miku. Wrapping things up a bit, I was wondering whether when it comes to the generative AI, what is your expectation for future developments under the umbrella of uh, generative AI, where will this be heading? And try to make some sort of bird's eye perspective, try to have the whole big picture in mind, what could potentially happen? And now that you started, um, I would propose Luna, maybe you go first. Um, thanks. So I personally think uh, there, will very, there will be a moment when these things be real time. Uh, like I expect that to happen relatively soon. So right now I'm working, for example, with stable diffusion and making a video that you just saw for 20 seconds would render our entire night. But I know that is the first image generation model that can produce such result. And as I, I think that how fast the development goes, I would expect that to be in real time, very fast. And then Talking about filters would be a whole other story. Um, and that's just from the images. Also, like with the music, I I, I think like uh, the, the music might catch up, the music making AI. Um, so there might be like a new hype phase where uh, we have prompts that make music. I think it exists already, but it's not so sophisticated yet how the how the audio, uh, how the images are. So yeah, these two things will be very big, I guess, for media in particular. Okay. Maybe Jules, would you like to continue what, what your individual viewpoint in this regard is? What will be the future developments? Um, I, I really have no idea. I'm not super interested in generative AI anymore. I mean, it's cool, but... Uh... I mean, I really like synthesizers. So this is a uh, this is a, a Stuber, and it this is a, a synthesizer by a company called Seat Lombard. And this, believe it or not, is an analog brain. So the circuits in it are designed so that as you patch it, you see nothing's labeled, and it's made of very nice wood. But as you patch it, um, it makes connections between parts of the circuit where normally you wouldn't have access to you normally have inputs and outputs but these points are sort of he calls them more androgynous and uh yeah i don't know that's really where i'm going i'm just like going way out and you know into uh the next that thousand years of being uh living in a medieval world with wooden synthesizers uh that do things that are very chaotic and unpredictable Yasha, what, what do you think? What are the future expectations you have or the expectations you have in regard to the future? I think it would it should get more accessible, more free. Computation will definitely get cheaper. So a lot more domains will open up very quickly. And just in sense of generative work, I think a lot of uh, like the boilerplate stuff that we do in a repetitive way that would go away for sure. Like if I have to generate a website, just I should not have to know how to code CSS just to do that. 
I think in a generative manner, a lot of processes will get much more easier for our existence, which gives us a lot more time to do many more things. So that's a good thing, I guess. Stefan, last but not least, it's your turn. Right now in the United States, for example, the actors and writers are striking because they are worried about losing their jobs due to generative AI and text and image-based generations. So I think society will continue to struggle finding a new balance. Uh, artists like us that that create things that have no specific education in one, one field, I think I think we, we will we will strive like because all of a sudden tools become more easily accessible. Like I don't really want to know how to like the behind the scenes of getting a 3D skeleton from a person. I just want that skeleton so that I can then actually create the interactive experience so that you and I in the same room can now interact with each other in a in a different way and a new way and like start talking to each other. So I mean, and I do hope that designing PCBs will become easier. That's still something that is very manual labor. So time saving aspects are very interesting so that you can really you can and you're forced to focus on on the ideas more and more young people that come in they have all these different tools but i am noticing with chat gpt for example i can tell them well just ask chat gpt to write you a little javascript or a python script and then that runs that data for you people that don't have programming skills can also do programs so that's interesting and there will be a lot of relearning that will have to happen i think so i mean i'm just sorry no i'm i'm just speechless I'm very uh, interested on in how the next generation of programmers will be with if they grow up with Copilot, which basically is writing things for you just by description. So it'll be uh, very interesting to see where this goes. I'm actually a little bit scared about that particularly because I, I think that programmers um, in the past have been benefiting from they could offer small services um like a, a lift from being that single person who would do all the jobs but with the ai i think it's possible that a, a big company um takes monopoly on some certain programming um models that would then be uh, available as a service maybe as a subscription based service uh, just how we all know the uh, all the other services and uh, that would be a very painful thing to happen in my opinion well I, i'm very scared about it to be honest yeah monetizing and making money and making a living will as the actor strike shows us will be will become difficult being creative and having your ideas come true will be easier which hopefully as society devolves and valuing culture more as through COVID, at least here in Canada, there was more money put into culture. And I hope that culture become more valuable and will, will be more possible too, thanks to those easier tools. I'm very glad that um, all of you will remain on board in this domain. And I think that together we will yeah, observe what dramatic differences AI might introduce to all of our practices. So with this concluding statement, um, I deeply thank you that you participated and that you attended the panel. And also to our international viewers, I say thank you that uh, you remained concentrated and stayed with us. So. By doing this, I say have a very good evening and enjoy the rest of the night. Thanks. Mm -hmm.